welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Brian Broom. And last week, we started talking about the ancient Israelites' justice system, how the law was to be administered. And today we're going to start digging into the law itself, the Ten Commandments that the Lord gave to Moses at Sinai. And we're going to take this one week at a time, Lord willing. Plans are subject to change, but we are going over the first commandment today. Seems like a very good place to start. At least we're starting to start with it. We're starting to start with it. Yeah, no guarantees. I remember when I was a teacher's apprentice, I was supposed to take three days to teach the Ten Commandments, and I took like two weeks. It was really bad. (laughs) (laughs) Poor Mrs. Andrews had to <laughs> adjust her teaching schedule because I messed it up. Uh, yeah, well, but today, uh, dear Kathy, in case you're listening, you know that you do that too. So I'm sure <laughs> you forgave Emily that one. It's hard. The thing is, when you start teaching the Bible seriously, it just seems to take longer and longer, largely because you have taught yourself in the process and you're so excited to share everything you know. But sometimes the realities of time constraints keep us from ever getting to Esther, Ezra, and Nehemiah, which is why we have (laughs) spoken sequence. Yeah, That's what I happen to be going through in my read through the Bible in a year plan right now. I'm in the Mm. middle of Nehemiah, which is wonderful. I love Nehemiah. It's my favorite. (sighs) I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We could start with all sorts of approaches, theologically, philosophically, sociologically, politically. We could begin with covenant outlining of the whole thing. I am Yahweh. I redeemed you. Here's a statement of sovereignty, suzerainty. Here's the historical prologue. Here's the stipulations that follow. There's more to it than that, but that's one way of approaching it. Uh, we could look at each of the commandments and see how each of them reflects the Trinitarian life of God and how each of them points to Christ. And at some point, we'll do that. But for now, let's let's, let's try, in, in the light of what you just described, to stay on focus <laughs> and, and, and talk about the heart of what God was saying when he said, no other gods before me. First thing we have to, we have to nail down is the before me. Uh, loads and loads of liberal historians and even theologians have said, see, what God was saying um, is that there were lots of gods in the world, and Israel was going to be going to be special in that it was going to make Yahweh the head of their pantheon, the most important <laughs> of gods, because, you know, um, their religion was still evolving, and they wouldn't reach a full-fledged monotheism until we get someplace to Isaiah or something. Deutero-Isaiah. Or Deutero-Isaiah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> What's yeah. what's the what's the Latin phrase for the third Isaiah? Because there's a third one too, supposedly. Oh, yeah, no, that's not what it means. The Hebrew has the idea of before my face. That is, don't have any other gods where I can see them. Now, unless you also want to make the plea of, oh, so God's see what he's saying is God's extremely nearsighted, <laughs> and as long as you can keep God and your idols out of the range of God's sight then it's okay. And if you know anything about Greek mythology, you know that this actually was was a thing. Yeah, Poseidon right now is down in Ethiopia dining with the queen, so he's not really online right now. So we can cheat on his claims. Let's just hope he doesn't get back before we're done. That's not what God <laughs> Mom's home, saying. get the dishes in the <laughs> yeah. dishwasher right now. <laughs> exactly. That's not what this is saying either. God has already revealed himself. In Genesis and, and uh, certainly in Exodus with the plagues and all of Egypt's gods, to be the only God there is. And that being so, he doesn't appreciate it when we set up other would-be gods within his sight, which is anywhere, whether it be in the backyard, in the basement, over the mantle, in the public square, in some deep, dark chamber or in the chambers of our imaginations. God does not want any idols anywhere. Now, the difference between the first and second commandment, second commandment talks about how we represent the true God. Mm -hmm. 
or how we shouldn't represent the true God more accurately. Well, this one's establishing our, our primary point of reference, our absolute. Who is God? And Yahweh, Jehovah, claims to be the true God, the only true God, the absolute God, the one who is self-defining, who calls himself I am. And he tells us that we have to orient all of our thinking, feeling, and choosing to that reality. Now, this contest between what God demands and what we would rather do, of course, goes all the way back to Eden, where Satan not so subtly suggested that there were other gods. Jehovah had said, eat of the tree and you die. Satan said, not, because, yeah, God, he never denies that, that this Yahweh person exists. He just <laughs> denies that he's all that he claims to be. Yeah, he said that, but he's, he can't carry that out. In other words, he's not the absolute transcendent, imminent, sovereign creator who rules all things. So to that degree, Satan was an atheist. The God, the true God does not exist. But you can be as God, so now he's a polytheist. Because the universe is, when we, when we scrap God as God, when we say God's not divine, we do not escape gods. We simply deify the universe. Because given the fact that we're finite, we have to deify something. We have to set our hearts on something. We have to find absolutes somewhere. If God isn't self-existent and, and thus the creator of the world, then the universe must be self-existent. Satan never claimed to be the creator. He simply claimed that God wasn't. So the universe is a given. It is divine. Okay, so now Satan's a pantheist and a polytheist and an atheist. And he tells men that they can be gods. Okay, so he's a humanist. You know, you go down, you go down the list, all of these things that sometimes we, we think about distinctly, which is which is fine for, for purposes of um, categorizing and, and dealing with, with subtle differences. But the main, th the main thrust here for our purposes is Satan said, you, you've been taught to believe in a creator God who commands you absolutely. I'm telling you by implication that there are many gods, none of them absolute. And you may or may not want to listen to them depending upon how close and dangerous they might be. But ultimately, you can be your own God and your own source of self-originating morality. You can make up the rules. Pick one. Uh, in school, where uh, the teachers are looking at how shall we then live? And one of the quotes we ran across very quickly is when everything, when, when we're done talking philosophy, there aren't many people left in the room. <laughs> and one of the teachers said, yeah, two. There's what God says, and there's what Satan says. And what Satan says has uh, 100,000 different modifications, but the basic worldview is always the same. The universe is self-existent. It's absolute. Man is part of that absoluteness. Therefore, he is potentially or actually God. And the forces that make up the universe, the question is, you probably shouldn't even say universes, that suggests some kind of, of unity, the make up reality are all gods of a sort, and man can control them, use them, become one of them. Just give him enough time, power, money, and knowledge. And he will come up with his own rules that are so much better than gods. But, but here's the thing for our discussion tonight. And every god will come up with different rules. Mm -hmm. as, as, as evangelical Christians, we are familiar with our own traditions and those of other churches. And we... we I'm going to suggest we not do this lest we be unnecessarily offensive. But I think we can invite people who are listening to think of other churches, other denominational traditions, and think through what they consider good and bad. Mm -hmm. There are some churches where you don't do X, you don't do Y, but you better do A and B. And other churches, A and B are absolutely horrible. At least they're really annoying. But J and K are right out. And, you know, you go down the list of the petty moralisms that the church, the churches have created over the years, because when we slip away from God's word and God's law, we don't stop having laws. It's never a yes. question of law versus no law. It's always a question of whose law. Mm -hmm. And so and the antinomians in the world can be the fiercest of legalists as they, they, they kick out God's law as oppressive, but they inevitably generate their own. And if it's true within Christian circles, it's most certainly true in the wider unbelieving world. Everybody, every system of thought, every philosophy, every economic system has its set of rules rooted in their conception of their absolute. Who is their God? The God is the one, as Satan saw, 
God is the one who tells you what right and wrong is. That was his definition. And to a degree, he wasn't far from right. You want to find out who the God of a system is, of a culture, of a nation. Look to see where they get their orders. Who, who may you not say to <laughs> with impunity? And with all the things going around in our culture today, I think we found, we, we, we've located and zeroed in on a couple of gods, one or two of which were obvious before, and a couple of which may be coming. Oh, I didn't know people listened to that that much. It's a, <laughs> like it's a false prophet or something. It just, if it's a, well, it'd be blunt. If it's on social media, <laughs> the prophet has spoken. How dare you question it? It's trending uh, on Twitter. It's that, and, and, you know, 12th commandment. There you go. <laughs> thou, shalt, thou shalt not abuse Twitter. Just Let's, as a, a yeah, side Brian, note. Was, go ahead. I was, I was about to say, you, you, Brian, you look like you want to say something. Please. I do. Um, so just as a side note, there's a great quote from uh, The Whole Christ by Sinclair Ferguson, where he mm -hmm. talks about legalism and antinomianism. I'll just read it because I found it. I was actually looking for this quote sometime last year and I couldn't find it. And now I've just happenstance found it after a quick Google search. I'm very happy. Anyway, <laughs> it says, although in one sense, antinomianism is the opposite error from legalism. In another sense, it's the equal error for it similarly abstracts God's law from God's person and character, which undergoes no change from old new covenant. It fails to appreciate that the law that condemns us for our sins was given to teach us how not to sin. Hmm. Wow. That's good. To quote John Thomas Jefferson, by way of Lin-Manuel Miranda, every <laughs> action has its equal opposite reaction. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. <laughs> if you haven't watched Hamilton yet, go watch yeah, Hamilton. Yeah, I haven't, and everyone oh tells goodness. me I should. And I've read Hamilton. I've read the Federalist Papers. I don't really... <laughs> I still people tell me they made something incredible and beautiful out of it, but I just it's, I just it's not it. made from the Federalist. Papers. I know, but I mean that's that's who he really was. I've also I also know something of his his life story, and it's it's not encouraging. Anyway, yeah. that's a side <laughs> issue. There's the play, but no. sorry, continue. So, <laughs> so what what we are first of all looking at then is a similarity or connection between polytheism, where every religion generates a system of law, of rules, a vision of this is how you shall then live. And they're all at odds with one another, but if they're not Christian, they're all, they, they agree on one thing. Christianity is not the one. We, 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 we may all be able to cooperate for a while, like so many Athenian gods on Olympus, but the one God who's not allowed to make a house call is Yahweh, the God of Israel, is not included because his claims are exclusive. He claims to be the only God there is. And so we have, as I said earlier, we have these two possibilities. We have continuity of being philosophy, the phrase we used at the beginning of all of these discussions, where all is one and the universe is absolute and, and, and self-existent. And all cultures that spring out of that idea. And then we have Christianity, the gospel, and the culture that's going to spring out of that. But now we have to talk a little bit about this idea of culture, what it means, what it doesn't mean, and to what degree pluralism, the presence, the accepted presence of many cultures in a society, can be a good thing, can be a bad thing. Hmm. So I think the starting point is man's heart and the dominion mandate or cultural mandate or creation mandate or Adamic covenant or whatever your tradition calls it. To begin then, and again, we've at school we've been reading How Shall We Then Live, one of the first things that Schaefer emphasizes, and I think this was perhaps new to some, some of our teachers, that culture, that is man's life, springs out of his heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he out of the heart are the issues of life. What a man is and does in all of his life springs from his heart, and it's in his heart that he stands face to face with God. The heart in Scripture is not the organ that pumps blood. It is the religious focus of man's being. It is the part of man or the center of man that is man himself that says, I, I it's want, not I will. 
the emotions necessarily. No, it's the it is inner not, man. Yeah, yeah, it's not the emotions, but it's the fountain of the emotions, as it's the fountain of the intellect and the fountain of the will. It stands at the root of all of these, and it's where man's basic commitments and values and priorities are inscribed or engraved. In the gospel, the Holy Spirit engraves God's law there. Outside of the work of the Holy Spirit, outside the gospel, man asserts his own autonomy there. I will be as God. I'm the most important being in the universe. I'm a, my needs and wants must be served. And everything has to bow to that. And he gets flavored by his own experiences and, and tendencies and opportunities and such. But we're talking here about a basic heart commitment, but both whether it's a Christian commitment or an anti-Christian commitment. First of all, there is reference here to God. You just heard it. Christian, anti-Christian, not Christian versus other possibilities. But as Satan showed us, there's only two possibilities. You are either in submission to God in Christ or you are at war at, with God and his Christ. And how you live out your life even in the simple details of whether or not you salt and pepper your fried eggs, whether or not you cook them in bacon grease, all of this is going to be reflected at some level to some degree, or it's going to reflect what's in your heart. Now, some things may not be obvious. I, I don't think we can probably try anybody's faith or the quality of their faith by seeing whether or not they use bacon grease. <laughs> to fry eggs. You can tell I... the quality of their physical heart, however. Yeah. <laughs> True. But that's another issue. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, there are some things that's really easy. If you see them summoning up demons, um, that's, you know, that there's a good hint there. If you see them bowing down to idols, you, 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 you get a good glimpse. But in between, there are all sorts of things that may not testify clearly to the religion of their maker, creator, inventor, designer. But from what scripture tells us, we do know that that maker, that creator, that human who made these things was most certainly religious. He is either a servant of God working in faith, or he is an enemy of God at war with God. And as Proverbs tells us, that even the plowing of the wicked is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin, the apostle tells us. The apostate is gathering, if it's something as simple as plowing, he's doing that to grow food, to continue his rebellion. Mm -hmm. Everything is oriented either in the service of the true God, that is Christ, or in the service of some idol within creation that is simply a reflection of the man's own heartfelt desires and priorities. So when we talk about culture, we're not talking simply about high culture. We're not talking <laughs> simply about uh, the stage or a ballet or renaissance painting or whatever, or, or etiquette at a fine restaurant. <laughs> We're talking about everything that flows out of a man's heart, which is to say all of his life. Mm -hmm. And we're saying that one's heart commitment is going to, there was a word I had that just lost it, but we'll go with influence and effect, incarnate itself in what he does. And sometimes this will be obvious in the finished product, and sometimes it won't. I could pick up, uh, we have somehow have ended up with multiple kinds of uh, silverware in our drawer. They don't all come from the same, same set, and sometimes we ask, how did we get this spoon? <laughs> Why do we still have this spoon? Um, and we, we, I, we cannot track the history of that spoon, and we certainly can't decide by looking at that spoon whether the man who made it was a Christian, an atheist, an agnostic, <laughs> a Hindu, a Muslim, but he was something. Mm -hmm. How do we know? Because he made something. And that imitation of the creator is an outgrowth or expression of man's existence as of the image of God. The, the catechisms and the confessions define the image of God rather narrowly in obedience to scripture. We speak of knowledge, righteousness, true holiness, and dominion. But as we look back at Genesis 1 to see what God might be like when Adam and Eve first heard, you're the image of God, we see a creator. We say a mover and shaker, one who thinks and speaks and calls beauty and wonder into existence. And then that he implants within man himself, this, this impulse to be prophet, king, and priest, to be a maker, a mover, an artist. So if a man makes something, that, that's a religious act, inevitably. 
the question then becomes, can we tell what religion, and does it matter to us? With a spoon, probably not. <laughs> Even if it was offered and sacrificed to idols, probably not. If it's a idol of Venus, yeah, that probably matters. And so we we need to, uh, and this I think is, is where our conversation is going tonight, we, we can look at different cultures and say, I really like the spoons that culture turned out. They're silver, they're beautifully styled. Oh, that culture is, say, Muslim. Well, I'm not Muslim. Muslim, Islam is an affront to God. It's an attack on the faith. That doesn't mean that these people as the image of God did not make beautiful spoons. They made them for the wrong reasons, the wrong motives. They didn't do it in faith. But living in God's universe and still bearing to some degree the image of God they made really cool spoons, and I'm going to start collecting them. <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah. I'd like to jump back. And on one level, this might be kind of jumping forward and short-circuiting some things. But it's also <laughs> kind of the the center about which this whole conversation is going to hmm. turn. Is A few moments ago, you said, um, what a, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Well, yeah. the flip side of that, then, is what makes anything acceptable to God? Ah. Emily, you're dragging in the gospel. This is a philosophic <laughs> conversation. Now, We're yeah. talking about the law. How can yeah. we also talk this about this? This is the Old <laughs> Testament. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. One of the great struggles, I think, that's appeared in, in Reformed theology over the cultural mandate or dominion mandate, and this whole connection of culture and religion, has been a temptation to separate faith in Christ from the dominion mandate, as if these were two separate things. God expects us to exercise dominion over his creation, but he also calls us to Christ for heaven and eternity and for worship. And it's some people don't seem to acknowledge that there even is a connection. It's like God has two hands and they're both busy, but they both belong <laughs> to God. We're going to honor both of them. The right hand um, doesn't know what the left hand is. Yeah, the, and sometimes this is, this is most certainly true. I think others have tried to connect them, but it's been somewhat awkward, at least in my experience. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe others have different awkward experiences. Awkward at best. Yeah. And, and, and so it would, maybe if this is a good place, you know, in a sense, you're, you're jumping to the end. But if we don't jump to that end, we may have no beginning anyhow. Mm -hmm. I think we need to understand the purpose of the dominion mandate in the first place. Okay. Glory of God. Granted, <laughs> beyond that, <laughs> we can talk about what, what the glory of God means, but I think the glory of God largely means the next two things. Did God want, did God give us um, an incomplete, undeveloped planet and say, make it better, make it prettier, gussy it up, dress and keep it? Yes, he did. Does God want us to imitate him and become an artist like he is? And Although he can call things out of nothing, we have to work what he gave us. But still, as faithful children, we're going to take this stuff and we're going to make really, we're going to make it even better and even cooler and turn it around. As a little girl draws a picture for daddy and says, look, daddy, it's a kitty. And daddy <laughs> says, oh, that's wonderful. Yes, that is most certainly part of it. I'm glad that, you told me it was a kitty because I wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think what sometimes we've missed, and, and maybe it's just because I've not read widely enough is that was never all that God had in mind. In fact, I would argue that that was secondary, if at best. Because when you read Genesis 1, and we've talked about this early on, uh, the, the, the whole d dominion thing comes right in the context of the image of God. Mm. God made man as, as his image and then said, have lots and lots of children. Lots. Remember when I said lots? Lots. Be fruitful and multiply and replace. Three times. You have children, have children, have children. God's kind of insistent that we fill the planet with people. But the word in, the, in that context would be man, fill it with men, with, with children of Adam. And he just defined what that means. Fill it with the image of God. Mm -hmm. Now, as we can now turn and look at Adam, and, and there's some things we would notice about them. Uh, you know, I, I actually, and I, I hadn't thought of this before. The first thing we would probably notice being us would be they're naked. And and I think uh, romanticism and certain forms of artistic expression and certain forms of environmentalism and 
a green movement, etc. Said, well, oh, but that's because nudity is so pure and innocent. That, that's not why they were naked. They were naked because they didn't have any clothes yet. Yet. And and some theologians and, and philosophers and, and, and writers and such have sort of assumed that innocence means nudity. No, they were innocent. And therefore, their nudity was not a problem. But they weren't supposed to stay that way <laughs> because there are there's more than one reason for having clothes. A walk along the riverbank would teach them very quickly that something on their feet would be good. There may have been no thorns, but have you ever tried to get into a, a kind of prickly bush and, 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 and cut it and trim it? I cannot imagine doing that with no clothes on. Actually, I Even can. It's rather thorns, disgusting. Like just branches, branches they poke huh? you. They, they don't have you. to have thorns to yeah. be painful. You, you, yeah. you, at some point, you're going to want some kind of apron thing so you're more efficient. You're going to want gloves at some place so you don't tear your hands as you pull up weeds. There's, and then at some point, the clothing does one other really cool thing. It makes you prettier. Mm -hmm. Oh, but they were beautiful already. Yes, they were. But that beauty could be improved upon, just as the garden's beauty could be improved upon. Dress and keep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have this, this uh, parallel between God making this people for himself and dressing them and keeping them. And mm -hmm. Adam and Eve dressing and keeping the garden. They know God not only as the creator, but as someone with whom they're in fellowship, whom they reverence. And who, as you say, dresses and keeps them. And now they've been told to dress and keep the garden as an apprenticeship. And they've, now they've also been told, hey, and the whole world's going to be yours. The implication being dress and keep the whole planet. But here's part of what I, I, I probably lost my, my thoughts in all this and getting sidetracked. But we, we would notice that Adam and Eve, in many respects, are very immature. Mm -hmm. There's a lot they don't know. Now, compared to us, they knew a lot. Oh, yeah. When God said bread, Adam knew exactly what bread was, even though he had never seen a wheat field work with yeast or built an oven or even seen fire at that point. They came pre-programmed with all kinds of knowledge and understanding, but they had yet to apply it. It's, it's like they had read all, they, they'd memorized Wikipedia, but they, they'd never even built a sandcastle, let alone a house. So there's, there's knowledge, but there's more to learn. There's the capacity for dominion, but they haven't exercised it yet. They've just barely begun in the garden. There's the maturity of, they haven't sinned, and at this point they don't want to, but there's going to be the greater maturity of facing temptation and overcoming it. And so what we have to look at here is not only sin versus obedience, rooted in faith, but immaturity versus maturity. They needed to grow up, just as, and as they grew up, they needed to take the planet with them. But it wasn't just Adam and Eve who needed to grow up. Had they survived that first test, all of humanity would face the same thing. Humanity was in its infancy. And that and here we need to, we need to look at sanctification, I think, a little bit differently. We we tend to look at sanctification, and, and rightly so on this side of the fall, as dealing with our sin and our rebellion and our stubbornness and our pride and all that. Hmm. But again, there is this thing of maturing in the faith. And we can look at Jesus in his humanity, his incarnation. Uh, Jesus grew in wisdom and in knowledge and in favor with God and man this of him as a small boy. Think about that. Here is the sinless son of God, but he grows in wisdom. He grows in favor with God. Uh, when we get to Hebrews, we're told that though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things he suffered. Even Jesus, without ever having sinned or having any inclination to sin, still could learn a deeper sort of obedience by encountering temptation and pushing through it and beyond it to trust his father more. And so in an unfallen world, that would have been what mankind needed to do. Now, here's the thing. How do you learn to trust God more if there are no challenges, no problems, no obstacles? If we just all automatically have this great depth of maturity where we all love one another and respect and submit without a thought, you uh, have no character arcs. <laughs> yeah, first of all, there's no story. Yeah. yeah. But um, this, this seems to be contrary to what God shows us in, in his own son. 
every child born into that unfallen world still, not a sinner, but still would need to grow up, both physically and spiritually. He would need to learn to trust his Heavenly Father more, to love others better, to submit to authority. And, and again, we mustn't confuse all these things with 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 sin, he would be beyond that. He's got that down. I'm going to follow God wherever. I'm going to do whatever God says. There's a difference between saying, I'm going to do whatever God says and doing it. Now, if your heart is pure, you will do it. But there is still a difference, and we have to insist on that. And so, how again, what, what's going to stir this up? Well, obstacles. Hey, Bob, let's go climb that mountain together. That mountain is a thousand, five thousand. That's mountains, five thousand feet tall. Let's go for it. <laughs> now they can't die. It's you know we're past death at this point. That doesn't mean they can't slip, slide, bump into each other, overcoming, climbing, even climbing a mountain is a big thing. How about a race? Hey, let's see who's faster. No jealousy, no envy. They're both encouraging each other. Right, oh, come on, you can do it. You can do it. <laughs> It's like the Great British Bake Off. <laughs> yes, competing with great politeness, except yes. when the camera turns on you when you're alone. Um, <laughs> except in this world, they, they would be sincere. They really, they really would be encouraging one another. But as, as time went on, that, that this would mean learning. Oh, you are faster! Wow, God made you faster than me. Praise God for that. That's great. Can you teach me to run faster? Learning the humility to learn from someone else. And you've got a long, long time. Hey, yeah, you're you're a great runner. Have you ever tried cooking? <laughs> my mom's a great cook. Want to learn from her? Well, yeah, that was on my. We can't call it a bucket list. No one's dying. That was on my <laughs> list of things I needed to do soon. Let's go talk to your mom. I would love it. And and little by little, oh, you burned. The, okay, you can't burn bacon. It doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> you burned the potatoes. <laughs> Ah, I gotta, I gotta cook this without burning. Is it a sin to burn potatoes? No. Sometimes we 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 use the word Eden was perfect, garden was perfect. Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't. That's the whole point. It was a garden which needed to be dressed, glorified, beautified by people who themselves were still in process and still maturing in the midst of a world that was a wilderness. There was a lot of stuff to do. But you would do it together, and as you did it together, as you did it as a community, as godly friends, trusting God every step of the way, submitting to him, loving each other, humbling yourself before each other, trusting each other, being brave together in the face of something that might be a little daunting, staying with that. I, I still don't get differential equations. No, I'll help you. Let's work through it one more time. Humanity itself would grow and mature in its trust in God, its faith, its love for one another. That's what would have happened. We sinned. And had God left us to ourselves, not destroyed us out of hand, just left us to ourselves, we would have turned all of that into tyrannizing one another, seducing one another, lying to one another. It's a, well, look at the world before the flood. It's basically what did happen. And then comes the promise of salvation in Christ. Now, what was true before is still true, except now it's harder, because now it's not simply the question of maturing, it's the question of obeying, but we can't. And even when we do, it's imperfect. We need, we need a couple things here. We need to have our sins forgiven, because we're at odds with God, we deserve hell. But we need our hearts changed. We need God's law written into our hearts. We need our whole nature to be transformed. And then as we go out with that new nature, trying by faith to do the good thing, we still need our, our, our works to be received, accepted, justified, because they're still not right. In other words, we need Jesus Christ. We need mm -hmm. the gospel. But does that mean that all the stuff I described before is now irrelevant. No, just me and Jesus, that's all it takes. No. If it was true before, how much more true is it now? I need, and if I'm going to overcome sin, if I'm going to grow in grace, if I'm going to trust in Jesus, I need you, and I need them, and I need her, and I need those people over there 
to feed into my life, to remind me of God's promises, to admonish and exhort me, to encourage me, to pray for me, and I need the obstacles of life. Mm. Uh, one of the questions that I keep getting right now in this um, unprecedented time, favorite word these days. If I had a quarter. For <laughs> what, what, what is this? Do? A lot of people are asking, what is God doing? Well, you know, I don't know all that God's doing by any means. I got one simple answer. He's making, he's shaking us up out of our spiritual lethargy and making us grow. The simple fact that that's not obvious suggests that we're a whole lot more spiritually lethargic than I may have thought. Mm -hmm. Did we expect to be carried to the grave on flowery beds of ease? Did we think that in America there is no tribulation, that that's only after, you know, Jesus comes back or something? That's only for certain certain peoples. Yeah, the Chinese get persecuted, but we're Americans. That doesn't happen here. God uses tribulations, trials, persecutions, and just the hard things of life, the obstacles, tax deadlines, not enough money in the bank account, the child who keeps crying all night long, the air outside. I, I don't know about you, but right now, uh, Brian, this may be true for Brian, I can see the air we're breathing. We have forest fires, and the air is full of smoke and ash right now. Okay, how do I deal with this? How is our church going to deal with this when we have we try to have outside worship this Sunday? I don't, I don't know yet. God keeps throwing at us our health challenges. God keeps throwing things at us so that we may learn to trust him. That is to trust Jesus, to trust that Jesus has a purpose in this. And the purpose is that we cling to him more tightly, love him more and count on his blood and righteousness to cover all the sins in all the areas of our life of everything we're doing, whether it be, you know, recording a podcast or doing secret things for the government that we can't even talk about, or uh, selling a product and a service, or cleaning a house, or teaching students, or, you know, you go down the list, in all of these things, God gives us different kinds of challenges that though we be sons, yet we learn obedience by the things we mm -hmm. suffer. I think the, uh, at least in the circles that I've grown up in and run in for the last several years, there's been less of a problem of just sticking with the gospel, like just sticking with Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 and not going on to Ephesians. I'm just going to read these verses because they're <laughs> going to say what I'm trying to say a lot better. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So you have this not only do we have the gospel that you're saved by grace, it's not of your works, but you're saved to good works. But then we have to think, well, what are those good works? Is it just doing sacred things like singing worship music and mm -hmm. preaching the gospel and acts of charity? Like, are those the things that are good to do now that I'm a Christian because they are somehow more holy than these other jobs that I also have to do to live, like laundry and cooking and things? I don't think so. I think the remembering that we were put on this earth to dress and keep it should shed so much light on what no. we're supposed to do as Christians. Mm -hmm. And what I'm arguing is that, again, there are the, there are the two things. God does want a prettier earth, a more developed earth, a more beautiful earth, a more functional earth. But he also wants us in the process to grow up ourselves so that in the end, when he looks at this planet, he sees it full of the image of God. But that image is a mature image, and it's got mature by working through the hard, physical, everyday things of life. And being conformed and to the image of his son. And being conformed to the image of his son, which is the end and purpose of the gospel. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I know what you meant, but let's let's be very careful about our language, or at least what how people might might understand your language. Mm -hmm. You said we have the gospel, and then <laughs> right. no, this and the gospel <laughs> continues to say, yeah, yeah, it, it's not just justification by faith; it's also mm -hmm. sanctification by faith. Yeah, 
It's the transformation of us and in transforming us, the transforming of all that we do and are and have. And so the dominion mandate and cultural mandate are not things aside in one corner, somehow separate from the gospel, but that process of working out what God originally commanded is absolutely key to our sanctification and to our worship. We worship God not only in church, and, and we need all of these things to do that, but all of our life is worship, priesthood of the believer. Everything we do, we bring as worship to God. So this this is some discussion. We could say a whole lot more. We're kind of getting off topic, but I think it's necessary <laughs> so that when we say that culture springs from faith, people have a clear idea of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it's not a faith aside from or beside our faith in Jesus as Savior. It is that very faith. It's faith in Jesus right. as Savior, which impels us to face the hard things of life, to glorify God in all of it, and to grow through it, but not to grow alone, to grow in connection with every other Christian. This is called the communion of the saints, the doctrine of the Holy Catholic Church, because mm -hmm. God's creating a bride, not a bunch of individuals. He's creating a body, a holy city. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also really important to note that we have to get this order correct. Yes. And uh, there's another error, which is to which is um, countermanded by acknowledging that an order exists. <laughs> you know, we are justified by our faith alone as a gift from God. And out from that, mm -hmm. as a result, that is the the basis of everything else. It's our, right. it's our faith in Christ that mm -hmm. is the, the foundation for all the good works that we do. The good works do not further make us worthy. <laughs> Because no, we're already made no. worthy. Yeah. To go back to what we were talking about with with clothing, if the fall had not happened, is that there's a wonderful explanation that I, I heard once ab about these parallels between the Adamic covenant and the Abrahamic and, and covenant of grace, mm -hmm. which is if man hadn't fallen, they would have made their own clothes. Yes. And because instead we fell, not only did God mm. slay an animal to clothe them, but then he also took his own son and slew him so that he could give us robes of white that are so bright. It, it's nothing earthly that can yes. make them that white. Yeah. And so there's this parallel between the way of the flesh and the way of the spirit, which is just the, the greater glory that we get, yeah. that yes. Christ gets as a result of his work in us. And we should always see it that way, that even in the things we're talking about now with good works and stuff, these aren't things that we're doing of our own power. This right. isn't something from our flesh, because our uh, Calvin says the, the human heart is a factory of idols, and mm -hmm. the scripture says that the, the, the heart is... Uh, no, I'm going to forget the Deceitful above all things? That one? Or... Thank you. <laughs> Who can understand it? Yeah. Um, and we need we need to recognize that that it we we don't do these things because of the goodness in us. We don't have it because it's not ours. Mm -hmm. It's an alien righteousness, an alien goodness that is gifted to us. And the faith itself is supernatural, mm -hmm. communicated to us by the Holy Spirit from Christ on the basis of what He has once for all accomplished on the cross. So we get nothing to glory in. Nothing we can all. thank God that he bothered to use us, but we have no claim on greater blessing or reward or anything. And should he, as the, as the Heidelberg Catechism says, uh, shouldn't shouldn't there be, God, shouldn't our good works count for something since God <laughs> does promise to reward them in this life and the next? And the Catechism simply says, the reward comes of grace, not of merit. <laughs> yes, God does promise to reward good works. I love There's that. There's no merit um, there whatsoever. Nope. I love that about the Heidelberg Catechism, that it comes up, like, the questions are not just, you know, what is this? What does that yeah. mean? This is, <laughs> it's like, well, don't you think? And then it's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It doesn't even spend a lot of time arguing. It's just, yeah. no. <laughs> Great. Get over it. Moving on. So, yes, good, good, good reminders all, Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, that the power is Christ 
And and here's something that my wife and I have been talking about a, a lot later. The the passage in um, I believe it's First Peter, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit who works obedience, sanctification is to obedience, not by obedience. It's unto obedience. He produces the obedience. And yet, at the same time, even that obedience needs to be sprinkled with the blood of Christ. Yeah. Our good works need to be forgiven. Mm -hmm. uh, we stand. Uh, the spiritual sacrifices we offer up to God are acceptable to God by Jesus Christ, Peter says later. So all of this is true. And, and, and yet, we can also affirm in complete harmony with the spirit of all that, that God's making us better than we were. Okay. It's not complete in this life. We get a major you know, level up at death when we're freed from sin. But ultimately, God's pushing toward the resurrection. And the resurrection, not simply me as an individual, but me as part of an entire church that will stand before God as the bride of Christ in the last day in a new heaven and a new earth. And that's the end of, well, that's the end of this story <laughs> or of this chapter. And as Lewis said, so the beginning of that new story that has no end where every chapter is better than the one before, because it too is a real story, one that we can't really conceive of yet because all of our stories involve the conflict with sin. But it'll be cool when the time comes. Now, now that we've done all that, now <laughs> we, we will hope that uh, the people listening to, that we've been clear enough that the people listening to us will say, got it. Faith in Christ produces uh, good works. Uh, generated by the Spirit of God on the basis of Christ's finished work. Christ receives them, the Father receives them because of Christ's shed blood. And this, this working in God's world both glorifies and perfects, improves the planet, and the communion of the saints, the, the, the fellowship of the church together. And, and, and the result is culture, stuff, activity, products, goods and services. Uh, inventions, paintings, art, story. Yeah. Now, the other side is refusing to trust in Christ has similar effects in that it produces stuff. The problem is the stuff it produces, given enough time, is absolutely horrible and abominable. It is the way of death. Now, because man's in the image of God, and because God, for Jesus' sake, restrains evil in the world so that none of us is as bad as we could be, pagan cultures do often produce, for a time, things that are usable and suitable and that do not so clearly reflect their disobedience to the point that Christians can't use them. They may do some very beautiful things. They may sim be, do some very beautiful things that yet at the same time reek of their lusts. You can look at some of Renaissance art. Some of it's great. Some of it is, wow, the technique here is incredible, but what did you paint and why am I looking mm -hmm. at it? And would I want my little girl to look at it? Uh, no, I actually would. But it's beautiful art. You're depriving your child of little. No, this, this, is, this is technically very skilled. Morally, it's disgusting and abominable. Well, what gives you the right to, to measure these things? The word of God. <laughs> I am not the one measuring. <laughs> <laughs> I am simply reporting to you God's measurement of it as recorded in Scripture. You can go read the Bible for yourself. The same laws that govern what Christians ought to do govern what pagans ought to do, but generally don't. And so we have the, the, these possibilities. And, and there are a couple places in scriptures that address, that addresses this head on. One is when the children of Israel come to the land of Canaan and subdue it. First of all, anybody who didn't leave, and a lot of people left, a lot of the Canaanites fled. But any of the pagans who decided to remain and resist were supposed to be executed. And um, then the children of Israel were told to do two very different things. If it's gardens and... Um, Olive yards and vineyards and wells and houses, keep them, use them. If they are idolatrous pictures, statues, implements of worship, destroy them, burn them, smash them. Now, our, our non-Christian friends may look at that and say, but those, th th those should be museum pieces. That's iconoclasm. Yeah. And, and God's response is, uh, no, <laughs> this was idolatry. And so, are you saying that this 
this statue to um, Ashtaroth that there's evil in it? No, there's no such thing as concentrated evil, except in Time <laughs> Bandits. Um, I'm so glad you made that reference so I didn't have to. <laughs> well, it's necessary because there's an, ex- there's an example of those who would make sin a metaphysical thing. And, you know, within our own ecclesiastical culture, sometimes we get the people that some we get people who seem to think that particular objects are, in fact, made of sin. And you should not have them or touch them because you will be sinful by even having them in your house. Well, but but what about this thing, this idol? Uh, what the Bible says, in effect, is that all that although all matter is morally, well, I won't say neutral. Good, God called it very good. Mm-hmm. We can do things to it that put it in such a condition that, with regard to us, there are no more good uses in its current form. Now, you could take that idol and you can smash it into crumbs, and those crumbs may, might be great for putting limestone back into your soil. There's a good use for it. <laughs> but to leave it in this particular condition, there is no valid use for it like this. And God says destroy it. So you have a wooden idol, right, that the, mm-hmm. the woodsman has worked so hard on. And yeah. you throw it into the fire. Better not breathe that in because that's concentrated evil when yeah. the smoke comes <laughs> out. I mean, that's just like, you know, it's a physical change. Those little yeah. particles. And this is, this is part of what the uh, the debate in the early church around eating meat offered to idols was around. Exactly. And yeah. that's where I was going to go next. So <laughs> thank you for anticipating that. I'll let you do that one in just a second. But, but let me... Uh, <laughs> Let me finish the thought to make it more modern. Most of us don't deal too much with idols unless you go into a Chinese restaurant, maybe. But we have something else that's called pornography. Would would any Christian argue that there is a valid use for the pornography as it exists in this current state? I think we would all say no. Well, is the sin in the paper or in the ink? No, it's in what we've done to put it together in this form. Is there a valid use for it? Yeah. Kindling. Burn it. Get rid of it. And and there are people who are upset about Christians for this. You you destroy art. You think it's pornography. I think it's high art. You're wrong. We're burning it. Well, you're just so anti-culture. No, we're anti-idolatry. And, and the pagan world at least pretends not to get that. There's a great deal in these in, in a pagan culture or Muslim culture, Shinto culture, you know, animistic culture, some things that are beautiful, some things that are useful, that we can make full of use of. As the children of Israel made use of what they found in Canaan, Canaan was saturated with magic and idolatry and abominable things, and yet God let them use an awful lot of it. What they had to get rid of was very narrow. And it was, in a sense, artistic. It's where, where men had focused their religious energies most self-consciously. And it was at that point but God said, no. Now, the second thing I was going to mention, thank you, Brian, is we offered to idols. And since you brought it up, I'll let you talk about it. Absolutely. So when it comes to meat offered to idols, Paul's main point is about knowledge and that mm-hmm. there were some people in, that's in Corinthians, isn't it? First Both in Romans and Corinthians. Yeah. First Corinthians, yeah. Thank you. I, I'm, the problem is I know the stories. I can't necessarily well, remember where <laughs> they take place. Um, and... Some people were using their knowledge. They had actual knowledge that yeah. idols are just wooden stone. There is mm-hmm. no, I don't want to say there's no spiritual dimension around it, but you know what I mean? The, yeah. the, the actual thing isn't a God. Right. And they were using this to say, oh, cool. Well, you know, the the pagan temples, they, they sell off the meat and they use really, really good cows when they do their yeah. pagan sacrifices. Oh, so yeah. we're going to take this meat and we're going to, we're going to eat it. And the weaker brethren struggled with this and they thought well i'm i thought we weren't supposed to be worshiping idols and these people are are there taking the meat from this and paul had to address it and he addresses it addresses it in terms of christian liberty which is yes you have knowledge and this knowledge is correct that these idols aren't real like they don't rep they don't contain the spiritual reality 
in and of themselves as the physical matter. And therefore, meat offered to them also doesn't contain this. It's what your heart motive is. I, I hate using the term heart motive, but it's the first thing that came to mind. Um, in eating it. Are you eating it as a form of worship towards this deity represented by this stone block that's been carved into a shape? Then you have a problem. <laughs> However, if you're just buying the leftover meat in the market, it doesn't affect you. It doesn't change you. It doesn't infect you. It doesn't make you mm -hmm. less of a Christian because you have this true knowledge of what it actually is. You understand it's just meat. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It is matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> because um, the earth is the Lord. So the fullness thereof, he says mm -hmm. a couple of times. Exactly. No, it belongs to God. God made it. It's not metaphysically, metaphysically evil. And therefore, it ha does have lawful uses, except for the man who eats with a weak conscience. He, he sees it. He can't get past the fact that as an idolater, that was part of his religious practice. I'm reminded here of a story of a, a young man who was, who was won to Christ by some... Um, some Lutherans, and he was very excited about his new faith, and he was excited to go to church for the first time. He came and sat down in church, and the organist started playing one of uh, Bach's, uh, what 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 is the proper musical term here? Cantata? Cantata and fugue. Okay, whatever. And the young man went wild and pale and ran out of the church as fast as he could. And his friends went out and said, "What? What? What's that all about? That was that was that was that was worship music. What's what? No, you don't understand. I was a Satanist, and every time we had a Satanic mass, that was the music we played. Oh my! Uh, wow! Yeah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah. And I would they say, know about Bach. I would <laughs> say Bach is rolling over in his grave, but he's German. He's too angry for that. He is throwing <laughs> steins from heaven. <laughs> But you see, and, and, and this is where what Paul would, would have us be aware of, we can't always understand the nature of the weaker brother, and therefore we are required to be sensitive, not to be proud and arrogant, but to keep our eyes open and see, are, is this offending somebody in the sense of, of frightening them away from the faith, weakening their walk with the Lord? Are they saying, wow, I think that's really simple, but Brian and Emily are doing it. They're strong Christians. I guess I could do it, but I don't think I should. But no, they're all peer pressure sets in. No, we don't. We won't show that weak soul perish for whom Christ died. And so this this whole thing of using the the artifacts of a pagan culture, mm. something as simple as meat, becomes something that requires spiritual sens sensitivity and true faith. Because there's a bigger picture here, and that's the building up of the body of Christ, the, the saint for whom Christ died, the body for whom Christ died. And so, whereas we are allowed to use a great deal of the pagan world in productive ways, uh, as you said, a hard attitude, I understand why you hesitate there, but I can't think of a better word either except for faith. The desires of our heart should be the coming of God's kingdom even in the little things, that weak brother beside us who does not understand why we're doing what we're doing. And so Paul's writings are full of, take a look around, think about this, you tripping somebody up. And it doesn't mean that we have to be afraid of, of offending legalists. That's completely different. He's talking about mm -hmm. weak brothers who really sincerely have a problem with this because they want to serve Christ, not because they want to make up rules and dominate people. There's a big difference there. Yeah. Uh, and so, again, the, the claims of Christ are on all of culture, but not just so we can pat ourselves in the back and, and show people how cultured we are. It, it's part of this process of, of growing the body of Christ. And that, that means that sometimes cultural interests, loosely considered, need to give way because the souls of men are more important to us. And yet, as we, as the soul grows, we're going to see greater and greater uh, commitment in that person's life, in all of his life, his work, his finances, his relationship with his wife and children, to the kingdom of God. We 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 can we can let this this thing go, with the firm conviction that God's at work here is going to do greater things in the real physical world. As time moves on, we don't have to have everything. We don't have to have all of our rights right now. We don't have to have our perfect idea of culture right now. 
we can we can give these things up because we know God plays a long game and we can wait on him. This is another line from the whole Christ. Uh -huh. The deepest response to antinomianism is not you are under the law, but rather you are despising the gospel and failing mm -hmm. to understand how the grace of God in the gospel works. Mm -hmm. There is no condemnation for you under the law because of your faith union with Christ. But that same faith union leads to the requirements of the law being fulfilled in you through the Spirit. Your real problem is not that you do not understand the law. It's that you do not understand the gospel. For Paul says that we are in law to Christ. Our relationship to the law is not a bare legal one, coldly impersonal. No, our conformity to it is the fruit of our marriage to our new husband, Jesus Christ. All right, that was so much cooler than what I was going to say, but you're right. <laughs> we will close with that. We will close. We do have to do recos. So lightning round, you have three seconds to decide what you're going to say and say it. The Calvinistic concept of culture by Henry Van Til, which sums up some of the historical and theological background of the things we've been talking about. Uh, if you want to uh, take a more scholarly but still readable approach to the things we're talking about, some of it will be in that book. It's worth reading. Calvinistic concept of culture. Cool. Do I have to catch up still from my absences? No. <laughs> no. no. Yeah, <laughs> one that. thing. We'll do that next time. Okay, one thing. I'm going to recommend, uh, in consonance with last week's uh recommendation for physical exercise, hiking. Not outside right now because it's on fire, but in general, hiking is wonderful and you should all do more of it. Yay, hiking. Go. My recommendation is audiobooks. They count as real books. Don't feel bad about not reading physical books if you're more of an audiobook person. Just consume the goodness that is books. That's my recommendation for your life. I second that recommendation. Thank you so much for listening. I know we've gone way over time, but I hope uh, you found this conversation fruitful. We did not cover hardly any of the points that we had outlined for ourselves, but we spent over an hour talking about the gospel. So time well spent, I consider. So I hope you've enjoyed listening to us. If you would like to send us an email, let us know what you think about this conversation or any other conversation that we've had by emailing us at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. Look forward to hearing from you. See you next week. <laughs>